um, a little bit different. Uh, how many of you are familiar with, with me or in the news and mental capacity? Okay, well, thank you. So usually, you know, when you, when you hear me speak, I talk about Twitter or Facebook or social strategy, which is really my wheelhouse. That's what I, I, I live and breathe and love. But today I'm going to talk a little bit more about women in leadership. And I have to say, you know, that the opening message that Todd gave when he talked about the butterfly effect it really kind of gave me chills. Because, you know, when I wrote that article about women in leadership, I guess that was back in August or, or so, it was something that was on my heart or something that was really, I was really passionate about and I put it out there. And so you can probably relate to this. You put something out there and you just hope that someone reads it, you hope that it touches somebody. And I'm just, you know, so thrilled that, that Susie reached out to me. And I walk in this room and I see all these amazing women and men who are here today. And it just, it really, really touched me. So thank you for being here. I really, really appreciate it. So I want to start off with a little bit about my story. Because, you know, it's funny, a lot of times, like I said, a lot of people want to talk a lot about it, that, you know, different things and social strategy. But some of you may not really sort of know my backstory. So I'd love to share that with, uh, with you right now. So I've been in marketing and branding for about 15 years, and really social, probably the last seven, which is social media that's sort of a life net, right? My start in real estate came in 2005. I was uh, the marketing director at a brokerage up in the San Francisco Bay Area, Empire Realty, and I had the privilege of being their marketing director for four years, really working belly to belly, face to face with many real estate agents, doing just about anything under the sun when it came to marketing. And just as a, sh as a show of hands, how many of you are real estate agents in the room? Okay, probably the majority. <laughs> so I've done everything from listing presentations to postcards to social media, marketing, everything, and listing presentations under the sun. And it was really a great opportunity to work face to face with agents. I was sharing a car today with John as he drove me uh, to, this, uh, to this wonderful event, how much I appreciate the entrepreneurial spirit of a real estate agent. You guys work harder than probably anybody else I know. Right? It's definitely not a 9 to 5 job. And I will say, though, after some time of working at, at Empire, and then some of you will probably get a kick out of this, many times working with real estate agents. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit like turning cats. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> the fact that you get those things to relate to them. And I do love working with real estate agents, but I felt like in about 2009, it was time for me to take my next step to be brave. And to, and to to see what else was out there. It was about that time I saw a tweet from In the News saying that they were looking for a, a marketing person. It was something along the lines of this, something along the lines of looking for someone who could crush it. <coughs> At the time, I just read Gary Vaynerchuk's book, Crush It. And I'm like, I can do that. That's me. <laughs> Call me up. So I tweeted him back. Uh, got, you know, interviews back and forth. Long story short, I, I came to work for In the News. So I was their social media director. And actually, before I became a social media director, they hired me to be their marketing person. So again, I did the marketing under the sun. It became very clear that social was really in my blood, that it was really you know, what I was passionate about. And so quickly, I uh, became a social media director and was able to really accomplish some exciting things, as Todd mentioned, the ambassador program that I grew at Inman. When we started at Inman, when I started in the news, in the news had about 5,000 fans and followers. And now today, we're at, a, at over 300,000 fans, followers, friends, likes. And so it's something I'm really, really proud of. I've been able to speak on many stages, uh, many different groups, many different organizations. But <laughs> that's my family as well. So that's my, that's the uh, pumpkin, pumpkin hunting, I guess, pumpkin patch hunting uh, a few weeks ago. So like many of you, and you know, as I heard it, Veronica, and I heard uh, Michelle, and Mona, and kind of share your stories. Obviously, we're not just women who work. We're not just successful women. All of us have our own stories of success. But many of you in the room have family in one sense or the other, whether it's kids or your dogs or your grandkids or extended family. And so, you know, sometimes having family and having that, you know, having that work-life balance, I want to know that there is actually such a thing as work-life balance, can be a little challenging. This is a picture of my new office. And the story leads me to where I am today. So uh, for some time now, I've been working through in the news and really kind of thinking of what was my next step. And if you've ever been in that spot where you kind of think, you know, I think, I think it's time for that next, that next move, that's where I've been. 
And so literally a month ago today, it's my one month anniversary, I started my own consulting firm.
So, do I have a little bit of guilt now and then? Yes, absolutely. I think probably any of us do if we have family and other responsibilities besides just business. <laughs> I 
know probably a lot of you can relate to this too. I can, I can think right now, off the top of my head, at least a handful of close women friends that don't raise their hand. That say, well, if I'm good enough, don't take me. I don't need to ask for a raise. I've been here for two years. They know that. No, they don't. <laughs> you need to remind them. And I really think in, in not just real estate, but in so many industries, why there aren't more women at the top is because they're not raising their hand to say, I can do that. Hey, I'm in right here. <laughs> you know, talk to me. And putting themselves out there. And you look at sort of the fundamental differences many times, not always, I know I mean there's the stereotypes here, but many times between men and women, many times men are not afraid to say, I can do that. Right? Yeah, right here, right here. <coughs> I think it was Ronnie who said something about how. You know, men will give the credit for the smallest thing. <laughs> yeah. Anything, right? And I, I literally laughed out loud because I could totally relate. Don't oh, offense, it is my own question. Poor Donald, right here. <laughs> 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 Thank you for coming today, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing I think is important, and, and we had a few references to Cheryl Sandberg earlier, and I'm going to reference her as well. Cheryl Sandberg is the COO of, of Facebook, someone I look to as a, as a mentor, uh, someone that I really look up to, and some of the things that she's done. And one of the things she talks about is sit at the table. Sit at the table, physically, <laughs> there's really a table to that, but also figuratively, meaning be a part of that conversation. Don't be afraid to raise your hand to say, I can do this, I can be a part of that. Be a part of the conversation. So many times I'm in meetings, and these ladies are shooting from relationships, I'm in mean, meetings, there might be you know, eight people in that meeting, six of them are, are men, and the two women hardly say anything because they're afraid of interrupting. They're so polite. And I am so guilty of this. I look around, there's so many of them personally who will probably know this. I, I just I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to like, be too mad. But sitting at the table, not being afraid to, to just interrupt a little bit, right? Because sometimes the guys aren't afraid to interrupt. <laughs> right? Research indicates that three or more women on corporate boards has a positive effect on a company's bottom line. As much as 42%. 42%. This is a, a screenshot from Cheryl's TED Talk. If you haven't seen Cheryl Sandberg's TED Talk, Google it. That's your homework. <laughs> I've probably seen it 50 times. It's, it's very motivational, very inspirational. It's a lot of what we're talking about today. The Cheryl Sandberg TED, TED. If you haven't seen TED Talks, by the way, that's one of the messages. Have you ever watched TED Talks? Yeah. I love it. Okay, if you don't watch TED Talks, we talk about feeding the soul. If you talk about feeding the soul, TED Talks are a fantastic way to do that. Sharon talks about don't leave before you leave. I love this. Don't leave before you leave. This really speaks to a lot of, a lot of younger women. And, you know, I can really relate to this. There's a lot of women in their 20s and 30s who think, well, I'm, I'm going to have kids one day. And so I want a job <laughs> where there are this kind of flexibility, or this kind of balance, or this or that. And so many women are thinking like, five years, ten years, way down the line, before things have even happened. Right? Maybe they don't even have a boyfriend yet, <laughs> or a partner. And they're already thinking ahead. Don't leave before you leave. And you know, this really resonated with me recently, because when I took that leap of faith to not be employed in the news, the, one of the most prestigious, biggest entities in real estate and start my own business. One of the reasons I was confident in that is because the whole time I was in it, I was in 150%. You know, I was in. I, I had kids and family and all these other responsibilities, but I was totally in. And so that gave me the opportunity to have a choice. So when the time came for me to say, I'm going to start my own business because I want to be home more, I want to have flexibility, I want to work with some other exciting brands, I had that choice because I didn't leave before I leave. I left. Does that make sense? Such a huge lesson for me. Hustle. I have this up in my right office. This is a uh, quote. I'm not read all of it, but it really big, it's the most important word to break in the middle there. It's hustle. This is also from Gary Vee. Again, another guy that's to Google. Go to Gary Vee check. Google Gary Vee check. He does swear a lot. So just a heads up on any of the videos, but so very inspirational for a number of great books. And he talks a lot about hustle. I totally believe in this. You know, and anything in the room who have had success, I'm sure you can relate to this. Isn't it all about the hustle? Right? It's all about just making it happen. I mean, yeah, some people are lucky and you meet the right people, but really at the end of the day, it's just about working really freaking hard. Right? Getting up early and staying up late and, and just doing what you got to do to get it done. Making the call, that extra contact, that extra email, that extra tweet, whatever it is, to go above 
above and beyond. Are you negotiating for yourself? This is another thing. It kind of goes back to raising your hand, to sitting at the table. Again, so many people I see don't negotiate for themselves. So many women do. Now, again, a lot of you probably do this because you're here. But if you're somebody who doesn't, think about it. And, and I really encourage you to negotiate for yourself, especially in the, in the workplace, especially in the real estate industry. There's a, an interesting thing that kind of come, up, come out in the news lately I want to share with you. This actually just came out a couple days ago. Want equal pay. Many women still not speaking up when it comes to salary. You know, there's this whole sort of divide between what women make, what men make, and this sort of, you know, big conversation. And I really believe that many times a woman doesn't make what a man makes. Now, there's all different, you know, theories behind this. My own personal opinion is because of where they start. A lot of women, when they get a new job, start low. And they're negotiating their salary, and they don't really negotiate. They sort of take whatever's offered, but they might ask a little bit higher. But they're many times afraid to ask, you know, for 20000 more, or really put it out there. Whereas, again, it becomes a man, not to be very difficult, but a role many times ask for that. And so when you start off low, right, how hard is it to get to that higher level that you want to get at? And it's going to cut off your other years this year. Studies have found that young women have lower salary expectations than their male peers. Economists call this the negotiating divide. And I think a lot of times it is our DNA. You know, we don't want to rock on each other, we don't want to rock the boat, we want to be even mad. Men tend to be overconfident and boast about their ability, and women in general tend to be a little bit more shy about it, a little bit more reserved. Again, if you start low, it's pretty hard to catch up, right? And sometimes women are our worst enemies. Wouldn't you agree? And sometimes we are. I mean, can't we just be really chatty sometimes? <laughs> what is she wearing? <laughs> is so and so. I mean, we're all guilty of Me, myself, and I included. <coughs> I look at some of the things in the media. Marissa Myers in the media a lot. She's the CEO, youngest CEO at Yahoo, 37 years old. In the weeks that followed her being promoted to CEO, almost every single article I read about Marissa Meyer was the fact that she was pregnant. Right? How many male CEOs at some point had pregnant women? <laughs> Why? To spouses, right? Again, you don't hear about her a whole lot because the focus was on her and having a baby versus her mind, her skills, her attributes, her leadership abilities. This is a controversial. New stand posts that came out, uh, new stand article that came out a few months ago about women breastfeeding. And you know, you might look at that in regards to how you feel about breastfeeding. It's 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 pretty eye opening, right? And and really, when you kind of dig into the, the undercurrent of it, it really helps to kind of foster women battling each other, you know, and going, well, I think this, and I think this, and and, and working, you know arguing with each other versus really working together. There's a lot of stuff in the media. Here's a good example, too. Hillary Clinton, again, regardless of how you feel politically, I can't tell you in the last, I don't know, 10 or 12 years how many times I've seen an article about Hillary and her pantsuits, yeah. <laughs> or her hair, or is she being weighed, or is she lost mm -hmm. weight, right? Who cares? Right? And there's so many things in the media. Another good example of, you know, things in the media. There's a great movie out that I really recommend you check this out, Mr. Kiss and Patient. Have you ever seen this? No, not yet. Okay, you need to Google this. <laughs> Lots of homework here. Mr. Kiss and Patient. This is a documentary that came out not too long ago, probably a few months ago. Uh, it was produced by Jennifer Newsom, Gavin Newsom's wife. Gavin Newsom's the former uh, mayor of San Francisco. And she really talks about women in the media. And if some of the stuff that I just talked about, about time and I and some of these things kind of resonate with you, I really encourage you to check it out. It's really incredible. Some of the things you want to think about in terms of how the media you know, portrays women. And, and I really encourage men and women to, to check out this film. I made my husband watch it. <laughs> you know, I, I said, sit down, you gotta see this. And it was very eye-opening as well. So I encourage you to check it out. It, it really says a lot, especially when we talk about women in leadership positions. The other thing that's really important, I think it's vitally important as women, is to surround ourselves with people who support and uplift and encourage each other. You know, it's really, really important. 
I'm a part of a Facebook group called the Power Women. Some of you are in our, uh, some of my Power Women in here. And we have a public group, I mean, it's not a private group, but the public group has about 300 or so people in it. And it was started by my friend Deborah, Deborah Trayvon up in uh, the Seattle area, with the whole purpose to engage, to empower, and to engage elevating the power. And what you'll see in that group, you'll see you know, women really lifting each other up, saying, hey, did you see so-and-so on their new website? Did you see so-and-so on their new listing they just got? Did you see so-and-so, you know, they just got this promotion? And there's a lot of that in this group, which is just so important. You know, everyone wants to get recognized. But no one wants to say, hey, look at me, I just did this. <laughs> we don't always want to raise our hand. So being a part of a group where, where women recognize each other is some really fantastic things we're discussing. And a lot of what I talk about today, some of these articles, things in the media, and, and uh, interesting statistics, this is a lot of the stuff that we talk about in that group. Now, out of that group, I've, we have sort of a little offshoot. We have a little private group, a little secret group. And there's nine of us that are in this sort of secret power women group. And uh, these are my girls. <laughs> and these are women that I never had met in person until probably pretty recently. Met them all through social media at some point or another for my travels and things that I've done. But these women are, are really women that, that I relate to. We can talk about things personally, professionally. Uh, it's, it's really a group of trust. And I really encourage you, if you're not part of a, a small group of women, maybe it's your friends, maybe it's colleagues, to, to really think about organizing. And Facebook is really a great avenue for that. You know, you can create, obviously, these big Facebook pages and big, massive groups. But sometimes some of the magic happens when you just get five or six or seven or eight women in a small group. And you might go, well, I can just call them. Well, I can just text them. I could just send them an email. But there's something about being in a, a kind of a small private group on Facebook, especially if you're on Facebook a lot. You can just pop in there, leave a message, hey, this is what's going on, hey, for me, I have this going on, whatever the case may be. We also use technology to connect with each other. So my small private power women group, we use an app called Boxer. Anybody use Boxer? It's a very cool app. So Boxer's like a walkie talkie app. It's on the iPhone, it's on the Android. And basically the way it works is you can, you can send voice messages to one person. So I can send a voice message to Mona, so <coughs> back to me. Or I can set up a group. And so with my power woman group, we have nine women who are on this boxer message. And so with the push of a button, it's kind of like the old next style of beep beep. Beep beep. Beep beep. You put the beep beep and you go, hey everybody, whatever, I'm in Arizona, how's it going? Hope everyone's doing great. What's going on with everybody today? And there's sort of this whole string of conversations that happen. It's literally quick little voice messages back and forth. And again, you might think, well, there's voicemail, I could just call them. Yes, if you have a phone too. <laughs> but with Boxer, it's an easy way to just sort of catch up on what's going on. It's a little photo, private. And there's something about just hearing someone's voice. You know, in this day and age of technology, wouldn't you agree? There's just something about hearing someone's voice and, and leaving a quick message. So, great little technology to check out if you haven't used it already. Do we really go for what we want? I kind of touched on this in a lot of things I talked about. Many times we don't. And for one reason or the other, do you? Something to think about, right? I have another story to share. So, anybody a fan of Oprah? No. <laughs> if you're not, then you will be after the story. So I'm a really big Oprah fan. I'm sort of like super fan. You know, I'm not a stalker or anything, but I'm a big fan of Oprah. <laughs> okay. And I have been trying, this is, you know, back at Oprah had her show. I have been trying to get tickets to the Oprah show literally for 10 years. You know, and, you know, so many requests and all that, all that kind of stuff. And I remember chatting with a former colleague of mine, and about sort of my little Oprah goal, my bucket list. And one day I'm going to go to go to the Oprah show. And she said, well, hey, why don't you put your money where your mouth is <laughs> and start a social media campaign around it? I was like, oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> she said, no, really. You know, think about it. We talk about social media all the time. It's how Twitter and Facebook and video. Think about it. And I thought about it. <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this. When something's on your bucket list, it's always one of those, like, well, one day I'm going to do this. I'd really like to do this one day. And then all of a sudden for me, this whole Oprah thing, like, well, maybe I could really 
24 days later, I got not one, but two calls from Harpo with an offer for tickets to the show. <coughs> so I share that story because, like I said, you know, putting yourself out there and saying, I'm going to go for this, I'm going to do this, so I'm going to stop saying, well, one day I'm going to do this, and really just make it happen. And for me, that was my over moment. And I think now, I have some of the other things in my box list. I'm like, okay, what's next? Yeah. What's next? Because life is short, right? So you think about everything that's happening on the East Coast right now, and all these people who are out of power, and their homes are destroyed, and oh my gosh, life is short, right? We're not promised anything beyond right now, right here. So 24 days later, receive that call. Like I said, receive two calls. I'll tell you real quick what those two calls were. The first call, was a call from one of the producers. Because one of the ways I had died, one of the many ways I had, I had you know, gotten in contact with the show was sent an email about me and my best friend. And they were doing a best friend show with Oprah and Gail. And they wanted the story of the best friend, so I wrote it about my best friend. And so that was the first call. And the second call was literally the next day from the assistant to the president at Harpo saying, I heard about what you're doing through Brad Emmett. Brad has been the president, doing with somebody else, and long story short, my whole story got back to him. So, very exciting. So fast forward to the show. There's me. <laughs> That's what Brad, I'm so excited. There's <laughs> me and my best friend, Lori. That's me, the audience. <laughs> Or are you committed to making things happen? So to wrap up 
healthcare, you know, in 2013, my vision is to see more women at the top joining that conversation, figuring out the whole balance thing, whatever that may be, crossing that thing on their bucket list. My question is, would you be there?